Reef has allowed me to build a larger community of marine conservation supporters worldwide by connecting people to the ocean through the Volunteer Fish Survey Project. I've helped with the mitigation of lionfish through publications, outreach, and removal actions. I've gained first-hand field experience building deep water lionfish traps and educating the public about invasive species. Through Reef, I've been able to share my passion for marine science with others by leading education programs both in person and virtual. Reef has allowed me to spread diversity and inclusion through marine science by highlighting the voices of minorities in the field. Reef is committed to using our programs, platform, and voice to build a better world for the conservation community by reducing barriers and supporting accessibility for all. The Oceans for All Fund is a pooled scholarship fund supported by individuals, businesses, and foundations committed to investing in a more equitable future for marine conservation. By partnering with Reef and adding your voice to this crucial work, you are helping the next generation of ocean stewards gain experience. Through Reef, by kindergarten and first grade students, we're able to learn about the invasive lionfish and their impact on the ecosystem. Go in the ocean to clean up the invasive species. Creating inclusive opportunities for others to cultivate connections with the ocean, regardless of zip code. Well, my favorite part was snorkeling. Coral reefs. <laughs> my first time. We got to see a lot of wildlife, animal, and sea creatures, and it was really beautiful. Together, we are making a difference in the health of our marine environment by increasing access and removing financial barriers. Through facilitating virtual field trips at no cost, issuing educational scholarships, and providing financial assistance to our marine conservation interests. Because of my reef internship, I've been able to build connections and explore new opportunities to advance my career in marine sciences. After learning about the Nassau Group, I want to protect the environment. There is no more overfishing. You can make a difference by participating in Reef's Oceans for All Fund. You can create opportunities for the next generation of ocean stewards and supporting foundational change in how we work going forward. Reef is exploration. Reef is empowering. Reef is impactful. Reef is preservation. The ocean's more important than you think. A fun time. It always seems like it's going to be such a long break, but um, I know for me it went really fast. It was such a great time catching up with everyone and and um, enjoying hearing the stories of the day out on the water and what you thought of the first two talks. Before we have our last talk of the evening, um, a couple things we wanted to do, and the first was just to acknowledge our staff and our interns. As you can imagine, <laughs> Um, so why don't you all come on up, staff and interns who are in the room right now. Maybe not everybody made it in here, but um, it is a big <laughs> undertaking putting together a what's basically a five-day festival for an international audience of people coming from all over. So th this isn't even all of us, but... Um, 
We are honored and blessed to have an amazing staff of 10 and often four marine conservation interns, often up to three marine conservation fellows at any given time. We are a, a small but mighty amazing team of dedicated um, people who are really working hard to, to make sure that reefs marine conservation mission can happen. So when you're emailing or you're calling on the phone or you're relying on something to happen, this is our team that's making it, making it all happen. All right, so um, rather than go down each one, this is our folks. I um, Make sure if you haven't met them, introduce yourselves, let them know how much you're enjoying your time here because it's been some early mornings and late nights, so make sure you let them know that it's worth it. So, all right, you may sit down. Martha's gonna stay. <laughs> all right, so Martha's just gonna say a few words, and um, for those of you who don't know, so we're the co-executive directors of REEF. For, we've been doing this kind of co-team, tag team model for about two years, but a lot longer than that. We've been working together for about 10, and um, we, uh, it's fun. So Martha's going to say a few things, and then I'm going to show a little video. And then Ben's going to talk. Okay, great. Thank you all for being here this evening. It's been really encouraging throughout the last couple days in this afternoon hearing people talk about the value of community. That's one of the things that I've heard come up in so many different conversations, how there's a connection that people have together. And not just the being together, but the joy of being together, the joy of finding new fish together, the joy of sharing your stories about fish with the other people who are also excited about those fish stories, and the chance to bring new people into that. Um, I think the other recurring theme that I've heard throughout conversations I've had the past few days has been about how little steps, little changes is how we make big progress. If you think about the most significant impacts, the biggest changes that have happened over time, it's been through all these small little steps. So thank you for the things that you're doing as part of the reef community and making those small steps and helping to make the change and build the community that made all of this possible. I know a lot of you traveled, you know, flew, drove, traveled a pretty long way to be here and we don't take that for granted. The time and the effort that you put into building this community and making this organization possible and helping to expand it, right? Because we believe in the work. That enthusiasm, like Andrea was talking about, how if you have a connection with someone who can guide you because you can see their passion and excitement of all the gifts that so many of you give from your time, your financial support, I think it's that passion and enthusiasm that makes the biggest difference in what we're doing. And one of the things that we've been working on um, in a really focused way over the past few years has been in looking at how can we open up those opportunities to bring new people into the community? How can we help connect new people with the oceans in ways that they might not have had an opportunity to experience before? So a few years ago, we started the Oceans for All initiative. And through that, I know a lot of you, a few of you in this room have really stepped up to support this program where we've started a fund to support programs to provide opportunities for people that might not have had a, a chance to build those connections with the oceans yet. Um, if you think about the diversity in the ocean, diversity is one of the ocean's greatest strengths. That's what we're trying to protect. We're trying to protect diversity of species, diversity of habitats, and that should be one of our strengths as well in bringing diversity into our community and really creating a welcoming space for people. So thank you for those of you who are helping to create that space, especially to those of you who have donated to help make that program possible. One of our interns, I think Maddie is here. I know she was in the lobby earlier. I don't know if she's here right now, but she created a video um, outlining what she saw as some of the important parts of the Oceans for All program. Uh, one of the major things that we do with the Oceans for All Fund, in addition to uh, scholarships for student programs, I was talking with someone earlier. I don't see her here today, but she works with, I don't see her right now. She works with a group of adaptive scuba divers. And we were talking about how, how amazing it is for our interns to have the chance to provide programs for adaptive scuba divers, both the experience for those adaptive divers and the experience for our interns to be a part of their learning. So the Oceans for All Fund provides 
uh, scholarships for students that may not have the opportunities to experience the ocean and programming. It also does a lot to support the internship program. This past year, we were able to provide, through the generosity of many of our reef members, we're able to provide uh, stipends for all of our interns. And our interns are doing so much. It was a previously, I can see the interns clapping in the background saying yes. Um, and that stipend has made it the program possible for a lot of people who wouldn't be able to participate otherwise. The intern program has had more than 100 interns over the years and the impact that they've had on ocean conservation. Have you ever heard the saying that the lives we change will change the world? That's really happening at Reef. That the students who are in that internship program have gone on to have amazing careers and have huge impact for conservation. So it's this, this seedling where we're helping those careers get started and to be able to provide the stipend so that it's not only available for people who have the financial connections. So we wanted to share the video that one of our uh, interns from last summer, uh, this past year, put together about that program. Reef has allowed me to build a larger community of marine conservation supporters worldwide by connecting people to the ocean through the bomb. Reef has allowed me to build a larger community of marine conservation supporters worldwide by connecting people to the ocean through the Volunteer Fish Survey Project. I've helped with the mitigation of lionfish through publications, outreach, and removal actions. I've gained first-hand field experience building deep water lionfish traps and educating the public about invasive species. Through Reef, I've been able to share my passion for marine science with others by leading education programs both in person and virtual. Reef has allowed me to spread diversity and inclusion through marine science by highlighting the voices of minorities in the field. Reef is committed to using our program's platform and voice to build a better world for the conservation community by reducing barriers and supporting accessibility for all. The Oceans for All Fund is a pooled scholarship fund supported by individuals, businesses, and foundations committed to investing in a more equitable future for marine conservation. By partnering with REEF and adding your voice to this crucial work, you are helping the next generation of ocean stewards gain experience. Through REEF, by kindergarten and first grade students, we're able to learn about the invasive lionfish and their impact on the ecosystem. Go in the ocean to clean up the invasive species. Creating inclusive opportunities for others to cultivate connections with the ocean, regardless of zip code. Well, my favorite part was snorkeling. Coral reefs. <laughs> my first time. We got to see a lot of wildlife, animal, and sea creatures, and it was really beautiful. Together, we are making a difference in the health of our marine environment by increasing access and removing financial barriers. Through facilitating virtual field trips at no cost, issuing educational scholarships, and providing financial assistance to our marine conservation interests. Because of my reef internship, I've been able to build connections and explore new opportunities to advance my career in marine sciences. After learning about the Nassau Reaper, I want to protect the environment. There is no more overfishing. You can make a difference by participating in Reef's Oceans for All Fund. You can create opportunities for the next generation of ocean stewards and supporting foundational change in how we work going forward. Reef is exploration. Reef is empowering. Reef is impactful. Reef is preservation. The ocean's more important than you think. We love Reef. Amazing job. So hopefully you all can pat Maddie on the back. She has um, left our uh, internship and our fellowship, but she's still around, which we're really grateful for, helping actually taking some pictures at the event this weekend. So. Without further ado, I'm really excited to welcome um, Dr. Ben Titus. I'm standing in his way. Um, ben and I uh, got to meet each other. Everything's measured in COVID now, right? So it was pre-COVID, like two years before. And um, I was invited to speak at MACNA, which is the Marine Aquarist Convention something, something, um, of, of Marine Aqu Home Aquarists. And, at the time, um, Ben was, he chaired the session that I talked in. He was, I think you were at AMNH at that time, right? American Museum of Natural History, working on a postdoc. And we got to talking after my talk about the reef program and the availability of the reef data and kind of a connection was made about, wow, this could be a really great resource to help some of the work that he's doing. So I think he'll tell you a little tiny bit about that at the end. 
Um, but now, so since his, since our time there at MACNA and his time at the museum, he spent some time in Switzerland with a, a fellowship there, amazingly, and now is a, a tenure track professor at the University of Alabama's Dauphin Marine Lab. So we're really lucky that he was able to make it over here and share some amazing work about anemone fishes and their anemones that they live with. So. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right, can you hear me? Okay, all right. Okay, a little closer. Okay, I'll try and stay right here. Um, well, thank you very much for sticking around after a happy hour, I appreciate that. And um, really thank you for the interview, or not the interview, the invitation um, to speak. This is my first ReFest and really excited to be here. And uh, yeah, thank you, thank you. And uh, Christy gave a great little introduction and I'm gonna follow that up with a little bit more. Um, I've had some really great experiences and been able to work literally all over the world at this point, um, from the deep south to New York City to Switzerland to the Midwest. Um, and the common theme, though, across all of these different stops um, really happens to be my, my research program, which is focused on tropical marine symbiosis. I'm really an evolutionary biologist and ecologist. And my research program is focused on this question, how does biodiversity evolve in tropical marine mutualisms? And the common organismal theme across all of these symbioses that I study happen to be tropical sea anemones. And so um, I had to at least shoehorn in one nice slide of tropical sea anemone diversity. These are six, uh, six species that I just collected from the Red Sea um, in August. So I was in Saudi Arabia for a couple of weeks um, working at KAUST and doing some collecting. And these are some of the beautiful and amazing examples of tropical anemone diversity. And among the anemones that live in the tropics, there are 10 of them that are described um, to host clownfishes, or as I am just finding out, anemone fishes, um, as a sea anemone biologist, I sort of just call them all clownfishes. I, I hear that's not the appropriate term. <laughs> I'll do better. I'll try and do better. Um, and so this is really where I focus the bulk of my um, uh, research time at the moment. Um, I have a, a current funding uh, through the National Science Foundation to do the evolution and the systematics and the, and the phylogenetics of these 10 species. Um, it's a huge range, and I don't think it'll come uh, as no surprise that we're going to find a lot more than 10 just clownfish hosting species. And so that's really where um, I spend the bulk of my time, um, and I'm going to do what Chris did, and I want to raise hands of how many of you have been to the Indo-Pacific and seen the clownfish sea anemone symbiosis in the wild. Wow, that is very impressive. And um, so I'll start with a little bit of background. Uh, this is from the, Mal the Maldives. Um, this is really the icon of tropical coral reefs, really globally. Uh, when you go scuba diving, people want to see clownfishes. They want to see anemones. And for good reason. These are colorful, charismatic animals. They live with these other beautiful animals on the reefs that look like flowers. They have fun behaviors. They don't really swim away. In fact, I think many of you, if you've been diving with clownfishes a lot, they will come get you uh, repeatedly, in fact, um, at almost an annoying rate. They, uh, they're very, very aggressive animals. Um, and this mutualism, um, and it is a mutualism, is, um, is, is famous throughout the world. It's really held up as a model example of symbiosis and a model example of mutualism. And it's really predicated on this ability of this really cool, amazing fish, the clownfish, um, and their ability to live in a reef fish predator. So sea anemones are voracious reef fish predators. They are highly venomous. And uh, the clownfish have evolved this ability to live in the tentacles unharmed. Um, that exact mechanism is not entirely known. Um, the best sort of consensus hypothesis at the moment is that the fish themselves have a mucus coating that the anemone recognizes as self. And so the anemone is not actually firing their nematocysts at the fish. And so um, no one actually knows how that works. And that is another mystery, but I'm not going to be talking about that today. Um, but the fish also provide some important benefits to the anemones as well. And so, like I mentioned, they're highly aggressive. Um, so these territorial little fish will chase off anemone predators. So you can actually go online and you can see video of clownfishes chasing off sea turtles, which come, up, come by and try and eat the anemones, uh, butterfly fishes, 
and uh, intrepid scientists who want to collect the anemones um, for their research. Um, also, one of the lesser known aspects of the symbiosis um, is that the fish um, also defecate in the anemone. And so they provide important nutrients to the anemones. So coral reefs obviously have these nutrient poor waters. And so clownfish waste serves as a, an important source of nitrogen to the anemone hosts. And um, the other thing that the fish does for the anemone is that as they swim through the tentacles, uh, they're actually, actually facilitating gas transfer. So they're helping oxygenate uh, their anemone hosts, especially at night. And so there's a lot of layers to this, to this mutualism. Um, I picked this particular fish um, because it's probably the most familiar and most famous of the clownfish species. This is the false clown anemone fish or the ocellaris clownfish. Um, it's what Nemo, I believe, was um, based off of. Um, I imagine everybody, I don't need to show hands, I know everyone's probably seen that movie multiple times. Um, but what you might not know is that this is uh, one of 28 described species of clownfishes in the, or anemone fishes in the genus Amphiprion. Um, and so you can see just by these sort of schematic drawing cartoons of the clownfish um, genus that there's a wide range of diversity in color and pattern and stripes. Um, and these are 28 described species. There's probably some more cryptic species that are out there to be discovered, at least through genetic sequencing. Um, and we have some ideas where those might be, um, but these are distributed across um, the entire, almost the entire Indo-Pacific. So they range from the Red Sea all the way through the Central Pacific. And as you can see, um, sometimes you might get one clownfish that just hangs out by itself in the Red Sea. So we have the endemic Red Sea Amphiprion bisynctus. Um, in other places, you might get two. Some places, like in the center of the coral triangle, you might get eight different clownfish species that all co-occur on the same reefs in association with these 10 different described species of anemones. And so through the years, um, particularly uh, from Gerald Allen and Daphne Fountain, um, these 28 described species have been binned, this is all pre-DNA sequencing, have been binned into different species complexes, um, binned into, into different groups based on their color and their pattern and the basic general body shape, their, their, morpho their morphology. And so these have been famously uh, named the skunk complex. Uh, so up here on the top left corner or the top right corner, depending on how you're looking at it, the tomato complex, the saddleback complex, the percula complex, the Clark eye complex, which is the most diverse. And then this lone ranger down here, the maroon clown Amphiprion biaculiatus, which actually just got moved um, into the genus Amphiprion from the genus Premnus. So that was been the lone, the lone holdover um, that was in a different genus, but it's all been unified. And to show you uh, what these look like for real, these are the real pictures of the fish. So we'll I have a lot of cartoons in this, <laughs> but I did want to show you some real pictures of fish. Um, and it stayed this way. And this is really how a lot of people still come to kind of understand clownfish diversity or through these species complexes that had been erected um, back in the in the 80s and, and early 90s. Um, and um, so there was really not much evolutionary mystery um, until DNA sequencing started to become prevalent for this group. And it wasn't really until um, 2012 that Glenn Litzios and uh, Nicholas Salomon, who ended up being one of my postdoc advisors, um, really published the first comprehensive phylogenetic study of the entire clownfish radiation. And they found a couple things that turned out to be really interesting and really important. And the first one was that they found that 25 of the 28 species have evolved within just the last 5 million years. And so these um, are a group of animals that have diversified rapidly. Um, that is a telltale sign of, of adaptive radiation, which is one of the most important evolutionary concepts. Uh, you may have, be familiar with Darwin's finches or Lake Tanganyika cichlids. Mammals are, are um, the result of adaptive radiation after the dinosaurs. And um, so it's a really important evolutionary process. We find that 25, in the last five, 25 species in the last 5 million years is exceptionally fast. Um, so that was the first thing uh, that they found. Um, the second thing that they found, which was really interesting, was that when you map the sort of color patterns of these fish onto the tree, you see that those groups that we had 
erected based on color and pattern alone really fall apart. And you see, you know, species that are black and white are scattered throughout the tree. You see that species that are, you know, in the skunk complex are scattered throughout the tree. And, and similarly with, with the tomato clownfishes as well, a lot of these colors and patterns seem to have evolved um, multiple times independently. And when that happens, we call that convergent evolution. And so that's a really important evolutionary process as well. Um, but it kind of threw things into a bit of a flux um, in terms of understanding how this diversity arose. Um, and that is the evolutionary mystery of the clownfish radiation. How um, and what evolutionary process gave rise to this much diversity, um, both in terms of the number of species, but also in terms of their phenotypic diversity, their colors and their patterns all evolved very, very rapidly. Well, the Litsios et al. group was also interested in this question. And um, one of the things that their papers showed was that, that the, this entire genus descended from a single common ancestor. And that single common ancestor um, was symbiotic with anemones. And their conclusion was that symbiosis with anemones triggered the adaptive radiation of the whole group. And so what they did, and naturally, they thought that maybe understanding the host associations between the fish and the anemones might give us some insight into how all these color patterns actually came to be. And so I'm going to pause on the Litzio's paper really quickly to bring up another seminal piece of clownfish sea anemone literature. And this was a famous field guide from Gerald Allen and Daphne Fountain, who is a sea anemone biologist. And they put together this um, book that was published in 1992, which was a comprehensive, really the first major comprehensive overview of the whole system, uh, biologically, ecologically, behaviorally. And they had spent 25, 30 years at that point um, traveling around the Indo-Pacific and documenting the associations between the fishes and the sea anemones. And so they created this table which shows the fish on the left and then the 10 host anemone species um, on the top. And every place you see a plus was an association between the fish and that species of anemone. So the Litzio's paper uh, used these associations to then map that onto the phylogenetic tree. And what they found was no pattern. <laughs> so you can see that some of the species that are black and white, some associate with only one species of anemone, some associate with all 10. You get a bunch of species that associate with two or three or four. It was a, it was a mess. So there was no real way to disentangle the role of the individual host sea anemones um, in terms of the evolutionary history and the colors and the patterns of the clownfishes. And so over the next 10 years, undeterred, uh, the same group um, published a lot of really interesting papers to continue to see um, if they could solve this mystery. Um, they looked at geography. So they looked at the role of geography and speciation. They looked at the role of the environment and specialism versus generalism. Uh, they looked at population genetics and they looked at hybridization. And each one of these papers was really, really great and really important and pushed the field forward and our general understanding of the symbiosis, but none of them could actually find the key ecological variable that really explains these striking patterns. Um, and so fast forward to uh, right before COVID, <laughs> the pre and post COVID days, um, I had written a postdoctoral fellowship through the EU um, with Nicholas um, at, to, to go work with him at the University of Lausanne. And it actually got funded one month before COVID shut the whole world down. And so um, eventually after visa issues and all sorts of fun things, uh, my family and I were able to move here to the spectacular spot right on uh, Lake Geneva and um, work with Nicholas and his group. And so the proposal that I wrote was actually to do the full genome sequencing of all the host anemones. So I was bringing the anemone side to the clownfish lab. And if you're wondering why they're in Switzerland, well, they're a computational biology department and um, they work on a lot of evolutionary methods. And, and this group is really leading the charge on all the full genome sequencing for the clownfishes. And so this was a really kind of a perfect marriage between backgrounds. 
Um, so when I arrived, actually, um, they had all the anemone or all the clownfish genomes um, for all 28 species, fully resolved tree, updated relationships among all the species. Every single branch is statistically fully resolved. Um, so these are this is the best clownfish tree um, that we have been able to produce. They have chromosome level genome assemblies, basically the best data um, that you can find. And it really still didn't solve anything from the color pattern perspective. So when I arrived, um, I was waiting on, on my samples to uh, be shipped from New York. And then I had to sequence them. So there was a few months that I had to just chase this down a rabbit hole, I guess. Um, and so one of the things that I felt like was a potential opportunity for us um, was the way we actually treated the anemone hosts in these analyses. And so typically what had been done is they used the table from the Fountain and Allen paper, and then they treat all the anemone hosts the exact same, right? So um, we know though that that doesn't really reflect what you see in the field. So when you go diving, I imagine all of you probably have seen that, hey, certain species associate with other anemones a lot more frequently than they do with others. And that's something that I had seen uh, when I was a master's student in the Red Sea and, and um, throughout my travels. And so it really, that was, that was my goal was how do we treat the anemones in an ecologically and biologically meaningful way that we can maybe extract some more information out of the symbiosis and maybe it'll help explain clownfish evolution um, in, a, in a better way. Um, but this presents a whole series of problems and questions. Um, so how do we do that? Um, how, do we, how do we extract this information? And um, it all starts um, first and foremost with what, what do we know about the way these fish interact with these anemones on coral reefs. Um, so the first thing, uh, like we just mentioned, we know that some clownfish species are found with some anemone hosts much more frequently uh, than they are with others. So that's a really good place to start. So we, we know that. Uh, the next thing that we know is that some anemones are preferred over other species, right? There's been a lot of papers um, that have looked at host preference, um, especially in the lab, um, where they've basically given the fish multiple choices and they just, you know, hey, I, I like species A versus species B. So we know that there's some inherent preference that's happening um, biologically. So that's, that's also important. Um, the other thing though, is that we know these are super competitive animals. And so the clown fishes compete for their preferred hosts, especially if you have two fish species that prefer the same anemone. Um, and so uh, when we combine all of this, um, an important thing that I started to realize, and I, maybe it's self-evident and I'm just slow on the uptake, um, <laughs> was that what you see in the field is not, not always truly reflective of preference, right? So, so the way that these animals associate with the anemone hosts in the wild is this combined outcome between preference and competition. Right? So if we're able to quantify how frequently these anemone fish or clownfishes are associating with different species of anemones, that is going to capture preference and competition in a single number or a single variable. And so that's a really important place. So this host association frequency was kind of the first thing that I thought of as, all right, this is, this is a good place to start understanding uh, the symbiosis maybe a little more relevantly. Um, however, um, there's an, an additional layer to this, and that is that not all sea anemones serve as reproductive adult habitat. And so this is um, really well documented in the literature. So some of the anemones only ever host juveniles or subadults or basically non-reproductive individuals. And some of them, um, some of the fish you only see will reproduce in certain species of anemones. And brings up a whole host of complicated things. Um, to, Chris talked about nursery habitats for the for the Goliath grouper. Um, so there had been some discussion in the literature about whether these anemones are true nurseries. Um, and if they are, then ecologically, that's very very important to consider and and, and incorporate into this um, into this analysis. 
Um, in another stroke of dumb luck, um, as a master's student, I got to spend a month in Jordan working in the Red Sea um, on this exact uh, problem um, where we had this clear host preference between um, the endemic species. They preferred this bubble tip anemone and they only saw juveniles in this other less preferred host. And so we actually did tackle this project, this problem for the species in the Red Sea. And amazingly, uh, we found that these anemones are not actually nursery habitats. So a definition for a nursery habitat is that the juveniles have to survive better and grow faster um, in the nursery habitat than they do in versus the adult habitat. So we saw juveniles that would recruit through, again, sort of dumb luck to the adult preferred hosts, and those individuals would grow faster and survive better than the individuals that recruited to these less preferred hosts. Um, and so ultimately, we could conclude that these are not nursery habitats, and that's really good news because then you can just ignore all the anemone hosts that just have juveniles in them, and that they're not nurseries, they're more or less developmental dead ends. Um, you don't see this sort of same ontogenetic shift from one host um, to a preferred host throughout like in a, a cohort's entire lifespan, um, like you do with the Goliath groupers from these mangrove habitats to these deeper um, sort of structured environments. Um, you don't see the same thing in clownfish. So this is really, really good news. So this has allowed me to generate this hypothesis that the adult reproductive host frequency is capturing the most biologically important aspects of the symbiosis in a single variable. It is capturing preference, it's capturing competition, it's capturing growth and survival because those are the hosts that lead to the best growth and most survival. And also probably the most all, all important variable, these are the anemones that these fish are reproducing in, right? And so these are ones that contribute to the next generation. Um, so this is a great hypothesis. The problem is that I don't have 30 years <laughs> to travel around the world and to go to every one of these countries where there is a clownfish or an anemone fish and quantify these host associations, right? Um, what uh, Daphne Fountain and Gerald Allen did over the course of, you know, a good chunk of their careers was really, really impressive. And as a postdoc, it's just not something I could do. <laughs> I also have a family and wanted to come home to them as a family. So, <laughs> um, so the solution, of course, then is citizen science. And so what I did um, in order to quantify these uh, reproduct these hosts, these adult reproductive um, host frequencies, was I, I relied on some minimal data that I had collected myself. But by and large, I relied very, very heavily on iNaturalists. So this is, I pulled this just the other day. Um, there are almost 7,000 observations for the genus Amphiprion. Um, over a thousand observer, individual observers have contributed to iNaturalist. And um, so what I did was I literally went through every single photograph for every single species and was able to then identify the anemone host that hosted that particular species of clownfish. And so these are some examples of photographs. Most of these are ones that I had taken myself, but these are pretty representative of what you see on iNaturalist, where you'll get a fish and you'll capture the anemone at the same time. And so this allows you to then download these data sets. And then in an Excel file, you can just you know mark the ID for that particular entry. The only thing I could not use were the images where it's just the fish, right? Obviously, I'm trying to quantify the host association, not just the identity of the fish. And then the other thing that you can do is a lot of times you're getting multiple fish in the same shot, is that you can then identify which fish are adults and which fish are juveniles. And so it was just a pretty uh, straightforward but painstaking process of actually going through <laughs> every single one of these photographs. Um, and the first thing I did was and I, I started here with the, the, the Fountain and Allen reference with these host associations. Um, and uh, through the iNaturalist data and, 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 you know, again, some of my own data that I had collected and some collaborator data as well, um, I was able to then independently verify um, everything here in green from Fountain and Allen. Um, everything in red was an association that I could not independently verify myself that they had listed in their book 
as as being um, an association. So this is really, I mean, for being in the 70s and 80s, this is unbelievable, right? Like that's a really, really impressive. Um, but one thing that I found, which was really um, one of the biggest surprises to me as a, an anemone person and not a fish person, was that I found 24 new associations across 10 clownfish species. So it turns out that this matrix that we had been using is just incomplete, which makes, again, makes sense given what they did and the scope of what they tried to do. Um, and so this was a massive update to, to these host associations. So immediately I went and I put these on the new full genome phylogenetic tree um, that the lab had in Switzerland. And again, no pattern at all. <laughs> and so, yeah, so we have the old associations are on the tips of the trees. I just sort of added these in PowerPoint one day and you know, you're just like, golly, like we were hoping that this would all fall apart and, and, and be perfect, but it wasn't. But um, I had the, the quantified association frequencies still. And so I had numbers for basically every species and was able to basically identify, hey, this is a primary host for adults. This one is not. And when I do that, and we just focus on the primary adult hosts, things simplify quite a lot, right? So for most species, um, there's still maybe multiple hosts, and but a lot of them now only really have one primary adult host. So then I did the same thing um, on the tree with just the primary adult hosts. And there's probably very few times you'll have in your career where you have this just, oh my God, moment. But I had one just sitting at my table late at night in Switzerland, and you plot this out and just like immediately struck that clownfish color pattern appears to be convergent and driven almost entirely by host use. So I'll walk you through this chart, this phylogenetic tree here, um, host by host, but everything that had this sort of maroonish color pattern with reduced number of stripes and stripe width ended up primarily being specializing on the bubble tip anemone and tecmea quadricolor. And again, this is a phenotype, a color pattern that's evolved independently across the tree multiple times. Everything that was sort of this creamsicle color orange, the skunk group, these primarily focused or specialize on Heteractus magnifica. And again, this is a color pattern that evolved on the tree multiple times. And then everything else that was black with multiple white stripes, and there's a couple exceptions here and there because, you know, <laughs> the natural world's not that perfect, um, is a generalist. A generalist or, and I have the little asterisk here, we have two species that associate um, with carpet anemones. And so that turns out to be this common denominator for everything that's black with multiple white stripes is that they're host generalists as reproductive adults. And the common denominator being they all will, will or can reproduce in these giant carpet anemones in the genus Stichodactyla. So this was unbelievable. Um, I was pretty floored when this pattern fell out, but of course you have to now test this statistically before you can you know, feel really good about it. So we did an analysis of uh, phylogenetic analysis of covariance and the details don't really matter all that much. Um, but we, we did a lot of quantification of clownfish color patterns as well to include in this analysis. And the take home message here is that um, very highly statistically significant that the reproductive host use is the single most important ecological variable that explains clownfish color pattern evolution. And this is controlling for phylogenetic relatedness. So basically what this means is that these fish that share the same color and pattern share that color and pattern because they share the same host, not because they're super close relatives, right? And so this was the big sort of amazing moment for us and me, obviously specifically, um, to explain, again, a lot of the variation here that we've seen um, and really put a nail in the coffin, I think, for this, this mystery of how clownfish color pattern has evolved. Now, there are, of course, a few caveats here and there, and a few of these species were light on data, but um, by and large, uh, we were thrilled to see this result. Um, so what does this do for us now? And this opens up a whole new line of questioning um, for the symbiosis that we were just not able to access um, 
previously. And so one of them that we were trying to get at now is like, what does color pattern mean? If you have the same color pattern that is evolving over and over and over again, when you have the same host, um, it clearly is being driven in the same direction um, for some reason. So what is, what is the color pattern? What is the function of the color pattern? That's something that um, we're really interested in um, and whether it has adaptive function. Um, some people have had previously proposed some interesting hypotheses. This was before we did all this updated work. Um, so maybe, yes, um, they might have some adaptive function. Um, we got a grant rejected <laughs> just recently. So we're going to resubmit that one and, and hopefully we'll be a little more successful next go around. Um, but that's amazing. So that's the first kind of take home message that I wanted to kind of leave you with. This app it opens up really just a massive amount of, of new research avenues for us to understand the symbiosis a little bit more holistically. Um, and then the second thing I wanted to leave you with is that um, this absolutely could not have been done without citizen science and iNaturalist and people who spend all their time and money traveling to these amazing places, taking awesome photographs, um, and then uploading those onto these databases that we can extract some really powerful information for. So um, people in this room, anyone here contribute to iNaturalist? Yeah? Awesome. Well, keep doing it, please. It's an unbelievable, unbelievable resource um, to be able to go in and then independently verify, hey, this ID is right, but also you're pulling out other information that you're not even inputting into the system, like host identification. Um, and then the last thing, and I, as I spread the, the gospel of sea anemones, is um, my NSF grant um, had a really fun, broader impact that hopefully will be of interest to many in this room. So Christy wrote a letter of support. And so we um, had proposed to create a small little re anemone uh, reef survey add-on to the fish reef fish survey. So we are uh, hopefully going to have some brainstorming sessions here for the weekend's over and start to really kind of develop um, how we can best approach adding the anemone host. If you're already collecting all these great fish data, I know you're not missing the clownfish as you swim down the reef. You may as well add the anemones too. So anemones, like, like corals, um, bleach, right, when they, when they get hot. Um, unlike corals, they have no skeletons. So um, they, they just dissolve. <laughs> they're, they're gross animals, really. Uh, <laughs> take them out of the water, they're disgusting. Um, but they just dissolve. So we have no clue um, what their abundance has been like historically. Um, and we have no idea if something goes catastrophically wrong with the population because they're gone before anyone can even visit that reef. So um, hopefully we can create sort of the first long-term uh, database on anemone diversity and abundance through reef. So um, really looking forward to having that and maybe there'll be some reef trips in the future um, with anemones. Um, so with that, I uh, want to acknowledge a few people, uh, specifically from the University of Lausanne, Dr. Uh, Nicholas Salomon, um, his postdoc, Teo, um, his PhD students, Baptiste and Alberto. Um, a lot of these data um, for the genomes and these analyses were done by them and they're wizards computationally. Um, so I wanted to make sure that I acknowledge them because they've been a huge, huge help and will co-author the resulting publications and everything. Funding um, was from uh, Marie Curie, the American Museum of Natural History and National Science Foundation. And then um, data sets from basically, you know, collaborators all over the world. So um, really a global, global effort here. And with that, I'm happy to take questions. Right. Does anybody have any questions about the amazing world of anemones and the fishes that live with them? <laughs> All right, I will ask. Oh, nope. Go ahead. I had several friends, mainly photographers, that are sitting and become bloodied by the attacks while they're trying to photograph, and I've. I've come up myself with a bloody forehead and fingers and so forth. But my question is, do you, have you found that one species over the other um, is more aggressive and more <laughs> than the other? Is there so, one meaner yeah, than actually, the other? To yeah, totally. Um, so just 
between like the Maldives. Um, I think they have two species there. I think I got attacked once by a little Clark eye um, anemone fish. Um, and I was again, just in Saudi Arabia doing work in the Red Sea for a couple of weeks and was attacked repeatedly. Every single dive, every anemone had some aggressive little fish in it. So I think, so the Red Sea species I think is by far the most aggressive that I've encountered so far. Um, but yeah, yeah, there's definitely variation in aggression. What's that? It could be breeding. That could be, I mean, I've been attacked by juveniles plenty too. Um, they're feisty at all life stages. Um, but yeah, there's, that's a great question. I, the aggressiveness and the variation in aggressiveness would be super interesting to look at and correlate with a number of different factors, but yeah, they, they have personalities and they're not all the same too. Yeah. Um, we have um, a couple marine tanks, and so we have some pairs in, yep. in both of them. Um, we had a, an enemy, and I don't, you probably can tell what kind it is, the one that they're in now. It took uh, like three months for the pair to. The bubble coats. I don't, was it a bubble coat? Whatever. Before they decided that they um, liked that an enemy. Yeah. And so I'm wondering, <laughs> you know. Like if there's not another one around, if the one they like is not around, you know, are they just like trying to accept that individual anemone or is it that class of anemone? So like if we put other anemones of that type in or would they, they just didn't like that? It's a great question. Um, so how, what do you, what you see in a tank and this, this becomes very hairy because the second you pull a fish out of the reef, they behave in every manner of unnatural, you know, way. Like, you'll see, you know, unnatural hosts. I've heard of stories of like condylactis, which is the giant Caribbean anemone here, um, hosting clownfishes sometimes. Um, you'll see fish swim through fake anemones or live in Xenia um, or, or, you know, Goniopera or other like sort of these long polyped soft corals. What's that? Yeah, sarcophyton. Yeah, that's a great one too. And so you see a lot of weird sort of unnatural behaviors the second you put them in a tank. Um, so yeah, I, I don't I don't know. They're finicky animals. <laughs> yeah, there's I think there's even studies where that people have shown like, you know, an, an anemone fish will prefer a species of anemone that they've just never even encountered in the wild, even. So there's all sorts of weird stuff going on with them, them behaviorally. Well, excuse my ignorance. This is really a stupid question. But all the anemones I've ever seen which aren't many, I only dive in Florida. Uh, you know, like they're beautiful, but are they all poisonous? I've never touched one. Yeah, so, so yeah. They're so all poisonous? Yeah, so anemones are cnidarians, like corals and jellyfishes. They, they belong to class anthozoa, and all of them are venomous. Yeah, so all of them have stinging cells, and so they capture prey. Um, you know, a lot of the ones that host clownfish will eat other reef fish. So, you know, they'll swim by... And the nematocysts grab on, they'll inject venom through the nematocysts. But then the anemones also release these sort of ambient toxins just into the water column. Um, and those toxins attack the mucus lining of fish gills. Um, and so, yeah, so they're, you know, to so their prey, they're very, very nasty. No, no, no. So, yeah, yeah, the, your hand, you can totally touch them. I would not recommend just going around touching them because some do sting. Um, you know, if you, yeah, sometimes, like, if you just poke your finger in one, you'll feel it attach, and then that's totally, that's fine. Don't, like, rub it on the inside of your arm or anything like that. <laughs> they can give you a little bit of a sting. Yeah. Yeah, but they're all venomous. Thanks, Ben. Maybe I'm giving anemones too much credit here, but <laughs> do they play any role in the selection process? It's a good question. It's actually a really good question. So I think the, the best hypothesis that we have is that, well, all the credit's been primarily given to the fish and this sort of acclimation process that I think they mostly go through where they kind of will nibble at tentacles or maybe rub up against parts of the side. Um, maybe something to stimulate the mucus production to allow them to then go in. 
Um, one of the things that's kind of interesting is that if you take your finger and like rub the column of an anemone and then you touch the tentacle, it will not stick to you, right? So they obviously they can recognize self um, to a certain degree. And so maybe there's a way that these animals and, and shrimp too, obviously, because there's lots of associations with other crustaceans, um, are somehow able to sort of molecularly mimic the anemone, but whether they play like an actual ho like a role in selection is is unclear and would be super interesting to look at. One question. Um, so I've been teaching about the, I've been learning about the clownfish in uh, in the Pacific and uh, seeing that some prefer to be shallower, other prefer to be deeper. So you have the true clownfish that usually you'll only find in the shallows, compared to the Clarks that are they vary from very shallow to deeper waters. Uh, but it's very interesting when they hatch and they drift with the current. How do they actually find that anemone that is theirs there? Yeah, it's a great question. So how do they find their, ho their host? It's almost certainly chemical. So they're keying in on chemical cues that are being released into the water column. Um, so I have a really great little data set again, because we're doing all the evolution and species delimitation of the hosts. I have a great data set from Japan that we're working up where we see two cryptic species of bubble tip anemone. So th two species of bubble tip, they look identical on the reef. Um, they occupy the same parts of the reef along the whole archipelago, um, but genetically wildly different. Um, can't tell them apart, but they host two different species of fish. Like that's the complete segregation. So these fish, they're keying in on something and I'm sure it's chemical. So they can tell these different cryptic anemones apart, um, even though we can't unless we sequence them. So yeah, so there's, there's that's a good question, but yeah, it's all, all sort of chemical homing, I think. I have a quick question. You were talking about the uh, juvenile's preference of host. Do you think that may be uh, competition related? Because, you know, the higher host is the breeding ground, so they'd have no choice, and that's the only other enemy, an enemy to, to fall back on? Yeah, yeah. This, this question opens up a whole can of worms um, because every anemone, and, and this is, there's a lot of variation across fish species, um, some some clownfish species or anemone fish species, you'll have your adult breeding pair, and then you'll have an aggregation of non-breeding individuals in the same anemone host. And you can have three or four or five or six non-breeders that are that the breeding pair just allows to live in this anemone. Um, actually, one of the questions we don't really know that um, Peter Buston at, at uh, Boston University is trying to ask is like, why are non-breeders tolerated in these hosts? Um, and we don't know. Um, so for certain, certain species, they'll tolerate a lot of non-breeders and in some, they may not tolerate any at all, or maybe only one. Um, but what, what Pete's group has shown too, is that they've experimentally manipulated, um, the, dis, uh, sort of the distribution of anemones where they've had an unoccupied anemone. That's only like a couple meters away from an, an anemone with two adults and at least one or two juveniles to the point where the juveniles will know that that anemone is available and they still won't leave. So they, it's too risky often for these fish to be migrating from, from their hosts. So I think it's, we feel pretty good about the fact that like, there's no sort of migration happening on a meaningful scale from these non preferred hosts to the preferred hosts at any point really. Yeah. Yeah. It's a really interesting line of research though. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, so maybe I missed it, but have you looked closely at like co-evolution between the t host, 10 host species? Um, and I don't know if you actually analyzed all that genetic data or is that a piece of what might be happening? Yeah. So I, I think that we might, might begin to see some of that as we tease apart these shallower speciation events in the anemones and maybe only in some groups. So one of the papers I published um, as a postdoc showed that the anemones have evolved the symbiosis with clownfishes three times independently. So, so actually, so the 28 anemone fish species, right? They've descended from a single common ancestor, but the anemones have not descended from a single common ancestor. So there's no co-evolutionary process that we know of yet 
linking the speciation in the anemones to the speciation in the fish. But as we tease that apart at a, you know, at a finer scale, then maybe we'll see something um, along those lines. But we need a lot more sampling before we can really answer that. Um, I, w I was really curious about the, uh, you mentioned the anemones bleaching yep. and the nutrient that they get if they do have, or do all anemones have a symbiosis with zooxanthellae like coral? And then is there some that get more nutrition that way that maybe would not benefit as much from clownfish? So yeah, great question. So they have the, the basically the same types of zooxanthellae or symbiodinium um, that corals have. Um, and, and so presumably most of these are getting the bulk of their nutrient requirement from the photosynthesis, um, and that symbiosis as well, just like corals. Um, the anemones are obviously way bigger. They can eat bigger prey. So, um, you know, we haven't done like the stable isotope analysis yet of the anemones to kind of tease out like where they're getting most of their carbon from, but, um, that's on our radar a little bit, I think. <laughs> Um, I had a question. Um, have has the mucus of each species of clownfish been tested against each species of a sea anemone to see if the the cells strike? Uh, no, not 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 sort of comprehensively. I know that there are a couple papers that have tried to look at that, um, but no. Yeah, we don't we don't really know that mechanism or or how that all works. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, really enjoyed that. I'm I'm going back to the question about the non-breeders. Yep. Um, so Disney lied to us. Yes. <laughs> In the first five minutes of, of Finding yeah, Nemo, totally. Disney lied to us. Yeah. Because when the mom died. The dad should have turned into mom. That's right. And <laughs> another, you know, individual should have turned into the, the male. That's right. That, that's there. Is there any chance that having, you know, some extras around is possibly part of the reason why they allow that? Even at, I realize that they're juveniles, but yeah. is it kind of like bet hedging that, you know, we're gonna keep we're gonna keep the band together? Yeah. So um, so so Peter Peter Buston has done all of this work pretty much. And, um, he's, he's shown that like the non-breeders are not close relatives. So there's no like kin selection thing going on. He's also shown that like the time to like resuming reproduction is not all that significantly interrupted. If you just have a pair of adults and one dies and then a new recruit comes in versus having, you know, an extra sitting around as a backup plan. I think they've also, um, shown that like having non-breeders doesn't significantly change the mortality rates of the adults. I mean, so that it's a really pretty big evolutionary mystery, like why you even tolerate it in the first place. So yeah, yeah, it's super cool. So this is a little different topic. Um, have you, have you looked at, do the anemone fish lure prey into the anemone at all? I don't know. I've heard stories along these lines um, that they've attract something at some point. I, I I think the answer is I don't know. I I would be surprised, but maybe not. I don't know. I've heard of I've heard of anecdotes of like mores eating the clownfish. So you know I'm you know what some presumably a lure would have to be like coming in for the fish and then the anemone getting it instead, and that would be a pretty big animal. But I don't know. <laughs> I've definitely heard that before, though. When you talk about um, breeders, non-breeders, and juveniles, are non-breeders and juveniles the same thing? Great question. Or can they be? Yeah, there's a distinction, actually. So, uh, yeah, you'll have your juvenile re new recruit, and then there's sort of like another size class that are what we call like a sub-adult, so like a not sexually mature fish that hasn't reached this adult reproductive status, but it's like clearly not a juvenile anymore. Yeah. So there is like a distinction. So non-breeders would encompass juveniles and sub-adults. Yeah. All right. So many great questions. Is any, everybody good? I think 
That's it? Yes? All right, one more hand for Ben. Yeah. Alrighty, thank you so much. So um, that concludes our evening. I do want to say a few words. Um, we, you know, we've talked about our staff and our interns and the fellows earlier, but we also have several volunteers who are reef members who live locally in the community who have helped make this event possible. Back there, Nancy Perez and Jane Bixby. And Charmaine, Nancy's friend, drove all the way from Miami to help this weekend, so thank you. And then most importantly, the man in the booth, woo! So David Hartman, David has been a longtime Reef member. He has been doing that tireless job for us since we started doing Reef Fest um, several years ago. It, it, it really makes a difference to help these talks go off technologically without a hitch. He comes here and volunteers all of his time to help make sure that we're all set up ahead of time. He makes sure that the, that all goes smoothly. And a couple of years ago, he started helping us live stream them. So now that even if our members aren't here in the room, they've been, you know, we've got dozens of people out there watching on Facebook and YouTube. If you have friends who you want to see what any of these talks, they'll be archived on Reef's YouTube page. Thanks to David. And David often has um, a sidekick, Daryl Duda, helping with all the mic stuff. And Daryl couldn't make it so. Hal, Burton, I really appreciate you stepping in on uh, Daryl's behalf to help shuffle the microphones around and everything. So, and then finally, um, the Government Center, obviously, we are really grateful that they allow us to use this wonderful facility. All their staff are really gracious, letting us kind of sneak in here in the middle of the workday and setting up and getting us access to the booth and everything else. So we really appreciate our friends here at the Government Center too. Um, and then lastly, our board, we have an amazing board of trustees. They're all volunteers as well. Um, it's a working board. We definitely don't let them rest. Um, and uh, obviously everybody knows Paul Human and Ned Deloach founded the organization. They both s still serve on the board. Paul, um, a couple of years ago, he served as the chair for all of its history until a few years ago, finally passed the torch and is emeritus now. Um, Anna Deloach is the chair of our board and works really hard to keep us all busy. So thank you, Anna. <laughs> um, and uh, most of our board are here, so you guys don't have to all come up, but I'll just, hopefully I don't miss anyone, but Scott Hapel, Alex Brilski, uh, Mel, where are you, Mel McCombie? Happy birthday, Mel, it's Mel's birthday! Um, Harris Friedberg, he served on our board for a long time, has now passed the baton as well. Who am I missing? Chuni, Chuni, where are you? Chuni right, right there in front of Anna and Ned. Uh, She's our newest member. And then we have a couple who couldn't be here, Janet Camp, uh, Jim Delapazzi, and I think that might be it. And Marta Bonatz, Marta, where are you? Not here, no. Um, so Marta lives here locally and helps a lot with um, things that are happening around the campus as well. So um, obviously, you know, as a grassroots conservation volunteer driven organization, everyone in this room is making a difference and we really appreciate all. So that wraps us up for tonight. Tomorrow, diving, snorkeling, kayaking, whatever you're doing in the morning, enjoy that. Doors will be open about 1.30 here, 2 o'clock. Richard will be signing books. We'll have more uh, available for sale. And then Richard's talk will be at 2.30 in this room tomorrow. Um, and then for those of you who have tickets to, for the love of the sea, that starts at 5, gates open about 4.30. And if you have questions about where that event happens, just ask any of us. It's up at about mile marker 103 or so, right next to Quiescence Diving Services. So thank you all. Have a great night. Thanks for coming.